Namaste, everyone. Welcome to The Next Normal in collaboration with America Meditating Radio. I'm your host, Sister Jenna, and we are still navigating our lives, and we will continue to do that, won't we? Whatever are the twists and the turns, the ups and the downs, the ins and the outs, so what? It's just life. You're going to have to move through it. But do you move through your life as if it's a novel? Do you move through your life where, you know, I was thinking actually during the pandemic, I've been kind of having like a little bit of a fantasy, like there's some people who act a particular roles and they to just express something else that they're not. And I was thinking to myself the other day, if I were to be something other than Sister Jenna, what would that be? Would you believe for the life of me, I couldn't figure that out? <laughs> it's just like you get so addicted, so attached to a particular role that you don't even dream anymore. One of the beautiful things about reading great books, you enter into the portal of the author and you start dreaming. Our next special guest is a returning guest to America Meditating Radio, but first time on Next Normal. And yesterday we had a really, really heart to heart conversation because I just felt like calling her and talking to her and seeing how she was doing as we were juxtaposing our schedule. So let me share a little bit about who we're about to have our heart to heart. Marianne Redini Spencer is the founder of the Redini Entertainment Corporation. As company president of the award-winning PR, marketing, multimedia, and TV and film production company, she's committed to creating, writing, producing, and promoting content that entertains, inspires, educates, and uplifts. Marianne has produced numerous movies and series for television. She is celebrated for co-producing and writing the teleplay for the Hallmark Hall of Fame movie, The Lost Valentine. She's the creator, writer, producer, and host of the Telly Award-winning Healthy Living Cooking Series, Cookbooks, and blog, Simply Delicious Living. With Marianne, and she's also an award-winning author, Marianne's latest release, which we will talk about today, is titled Secrets of Grace Manor, a Kate Grace novel. Please welcome the beautiful, amazing Marianne Redini Spencer. Marianne, thank you for joining us on the show today. Sure, it's so nice to be here. Sure is, it brings back memories. And I think that the last year and a half has been one of a much more deeper awakening for you. Would you be open enough to share what it's been like for you? Sure. Um, I uh, went through a lot of changes just before COVID. And during COVID, uh, or two weeks before it broke on the news, I moved into a new house. Um, I had changes in my personal life. I'm no longer in that relationship. And um, I'm in a new neighborhood, <laughs> different part of town. And COVID hit. And I'm stuck in my house by myself. And it was very interesting. And it was an incredible experience because... I really had to think and process and it gave me the time to think and process a lot. And I also could create a new space uh, for myself, decorating it how I wanted to do it. Um, we, we were able to, I was able to go out and go thrift shopping with my mask on. <laughs> so I little, did a little bit of that, but I, I got to explore some other creativity. I started cooking in a new kitchen and so all this new energy was coming in and um, it was very, in a way now it's like, this is my little haven. You know, I created something that I needed. I needed to feel safe and calm. And I did really, I created that, that space because what I went through uh, was very tumultuous. A lot of changes uh, where I was living. I didn't know where I was going to be living. I also went through it. Um, I have my own business, but clients changed. So there was a lot of changes going on. I'm like, oh my gosh, where am I supposed to be? What am I supposed to be doing? And so when I I, and I looked at, I probably drove my real estate agent bonkers because I looked at a million different places. But as soon as I walked in to this place, I'm like, this is it. You know, this, I, I know I can do this, you know, and I felt 
at home. And it's a happy, it felt very happy, the energy for me. And I knew that I had to feel happy and safe because I was going through so much. And then the world, two weeks later, the world went in crisis. So, um, and I think even being by myself, learning to do Zoom like everybody <laughs> and reaching out to friends and family through Zoom on a different coast uh, because no one was able to travel, that was really vital, keeping that connection. I have to tell you that I went through something similar too with relocating. And I remembered there's that feeling you get when you look at that house or look at the driveway Mm -hmm. You know, it's, I, I don't know, you really felt like it was home. Yeah. And moving in a new space, right before COVID or during a pandemic, and being by yourself, were there ever moments in which you really felt like pulling your hair out? Like, where do I go? What do I do? Where do I sit? How often do I go into the refrigerator and look and there's <laughs> the same food that's in there? <laughs> You know, um, yes, I have to say the first month or two, I'm like, what's happening? Where am I? You know, in terms of the world, I've always felt comfortable in the house because I had my little things that made me comfortable, my comfortable sofa, you know, or I created that space that I knew I needed. And I did it quickly. I was like unpacked and all the pictures were up in a weekend. <laughs> Because I'm like, there's too much turmoil. I need to have like my space where I feel comfortable. So, but yes, I did. And it, I think, and I know we talked about this. I watched, was watching the news 24 seven bad. It's okay to get the news. It's important to know what's going on, but what was happening, it, it was almost like I was in a vacuum of stress, anxiety, and confusion. And when I turned it off, and also stop looking at social media so much. I'm like, oh, I kind of like this feeling, you know, and I was able to get back into my writing because it's the first month or two I couldn't write. And I was working on my novel and I, I had a deadline. I want to get it done to the editor by a certain time. So when I did that and kind of like calmed myself and was able to sit and write and put myself on a schedule where I made sure that I was walking every morning, but I live by a park. There's not, and you know, there were people walking, but it's not a busy place. So I was able to walk, kind of listen to the birds, look at the pretty trees, <laughs> you know, get into nature and um, just like be me. And I think basically I'm pretty happy and an optimistic person. So, you know, I can't, and I need, to, I, I definitely am empathetic. So if I'm in a place where I'm, I start feeling like I need to run and hide and like be in a quiet place so I can ground myself again. So I grounded myself. Beautiful. Congrats. So, you know, what was it that started you on the pathway of storytelling? Some of us are so good at telling stories and some of us are really awful, but I have found that for me, I learned so quickly through stories. I learned a lot about myself through stories. I even learned a lot about other people by listening to stories. What was that? Was there a trigger, something that went off for you, you when know, you were younger, like it popped and you went, I need to tell stories. I remember when I was like nine years old, I was in the driveway with my friends and we were playing and they were like, well, we're going to get married and have like 3.2 children and this and that. And I'm like, well, I know that I'm going to move to Hollywood and get married much later <laughs> and make movies. And they're like, what? Cause I'm from the East coast. And they're like, where did that come from? And so I ended up doing that. I studied communications and what have you. And I knew that I always wanted to write novels, um, but I didn't, it was such a process. Um, I worked for the school newspaper and I was also a journalist early on in my career. And I did work for CNN as a producer writer, but journalism, not creative writing, even though I always knew and would tell people I want to write cookbooks, you know, I want to write novels and movies. But that didn't happen till a lot later because I kind of had to learn the process and learn how. And it was overwhelming for me um, to even think, well, how can I write a book? You know, that's a lot of pages. <laughs> like, how's that going to happen? 
<laughs> like, what am I going to write about? Do I have that much to say? So I started move with movies and TV shows. And I, I told other people's stories and I helped them get their stories off the ground until that became like, why am I telling everyone else's story, but my story? <laughs> and it's a lot of work and it, sometimes they don't get off the ground and you put a lot of time and effort in. And so The Lost Valentine was actually one of the first movies I wrote. And I was very fortunate to have CBS and Hallmark Hall of Fame pick it up and Betty White, you know, play the lead. How, how, how great is that? And, um, and so after that, I wrote a, a number of other movies and um, started writing novels I started writing um, Lady in the Window, my first novel, and then I put it down. And then it, the story just came to first the title came to me and then the story. But once I made up my mind and understood that I can construct a novel like I do my movies, then I thought, oh, OK, I can do that. Now I can really do it. I know I have like a blueprint and I can explain that if you want. But but. When I when I was writing that novel, all the other books started coming to me. So whenever I'm writing something, something else comes to me. And I keep a journal of other ideas because I have a lot of other ideas I want to tell, which aren't necessarily Kate Grace novels. And um, I also find ideas looking at art, listening to music. Um, a lot comes to me when I'm driving, like long distances. So, But I always knew that I wanted to tell stories and... I just remember I tied that to when I was a child and maybe even playing with dolls. You know, I'd, I'd give them lines to say. <laughs> just your destiny. You just had to take us into a world of fantasy. You just mentioned that you had a blueprint. What if somebody's thinking of also going into writing, you know, movies or a novel? Uh, are there some steps that you could offer them? Absolutely. Um, I can, I can definitely do that. And, some of the books that I read when I was writing, and I, I, someone gave me the book, The Lost Valentine, and said, this is your kind of thing. You could like really write this. They knew I wanted to write scripts that I hadn't really written. It. And I looked at it and I read it and I loved it. And I go, yeah, I really like this. So, OK, I, I need to have it in script form to pitch it. So basically what I did, I read Sid Field books. Sid Field is a very famous writer of books on how to write screenplays. Um, Ken Achity wrote a book called um, A Writer's Time, which was very helpful. But what actually did it for me is I break down uh, in movies, there's uh, acts that use seven acts, and then there's a certain number of scenes per, per act. And when you start reading scripts, which are available, I mean, many scripts you can read online. And I used to have to do that a lot when I worked for the studios um, because we had to do synopsises and summaries. So I would read scripts and read anything you can get your hands on. But I took the outline that I used, I that I use for script writing. And I can give that to you. I can give that to anyone because what it is, it's just numbers. But what the hard part is sitting down and going through and going back and forth, because that outline I play with for a long time, and that changes, but I want to get a basic outline so I know what's happening. And then I will sit down to write when I feel comfortable, like this is a good outline. And the outline can change. And it's one line per, uh, like one, two, three, four, five, one line per scene. And then you just feel it. Once you start writing the, um, the, the character voices start coming to you. you. You do your research before you do that. But things happen when you when you put like two or three hours aside and you know that you don't have to write the whole thing in one sitting, maybe five pages, that's it. And when you sit and it just, okay, so put music on, candle, whatever you have to do to get to sit at the desk and just kind of like, okay, this is going to happen now in this scene. This I, And then start, you just get into it. Like I see it, like I'm watching a movie. I and, love that. And sometimes I hear things and it's like, wow, that's interesting. Or a character will say something that cracks me up. You know, it's kind of weird, but you get into that moment and, and you just see it and you kind of yeah. feel it. 
And, you know, when you're writing, you want to experience it. And because I'm so visual and I'm so movie oriented, I want to see it. I, I, I not I want to read it. And with novels, it's great because you can go into the character. You can go into what they're thinking, what their history is. You can't do that in a movie. When you write a screenplay, it's like a few lines of where you are, what's, you know, what time period it is or something. And then it's it's, you know, you have to read between the lines. You're telling things not overtly, but you're doing it with dialogue. With yeah. this, you can really, it's just incredible because you can really go and describe it in such detail. Would you say that you're an introvert or an extrovert? Because I know that introverts tend to be so super creative. A little bit of both. Okay. I don't know. I think like I am an introvert, but I love people. Uh You know, I really love people. And I found that I do have a very high level of creativity, but I haven't channeled it to that. I haven't channeled my creativity to writing, to music. But during the pandemic, Marianne, I've been wanting to, you know. Now, sure. you've got this new book out, The Secrets of Grace Manor, a Kate Grace novel. I mean, where did that come from? Did that come from during the pandemic or were you working on that before? I had the idea for it while I was writing The Paradise Table, which is the second book in that series. I got the title. I get titles. Don't, and what, and it, with my next book, I, I got the cover. I dreamt I was dreaming and I woke up and I saw the cover in my, you know, like, wow. And the title. (laughs) So it was wild. But um, I, I started when I was writing the paradise table, that idea came to me and something happened in childhood where we were told something in my growing up because all authors incorporate little bits and pieces in of, but I knew that I wanted to write about tolerance, understanding, um, people who had been put in situations um, in life that they had to overcome because of prejudice and things like that. I knew I wanted to write about that theme before. Actually, I knew that before anything. I knew as I was writing Paradise Table, I wanted to write because I, I say that I write things that educate, uplift, and what have you. But I also love the idea because these books take place partly in Hawaii, Hawaiian islands. And I love the meaning of aloha and what that means and how to express love and compassion and understanding and realizing that we're all part of the human ohana, the race of human, and we need to treat each other with love and respect and kindness. And I thought I need to write about intolerance and how and what happens and try to understand what is going on in that situation. So I said, Kate lives in the present day, but I said something in the 19th century in the 1800s and um, about a relative, she uncovers a secret and the mystery comes out of that. Um, And it comes out of hiding things and, um, escaping getting married who to someone you shouldn't necessarily be married to because of the caste system and you know and then people hiding their religion because of intolerance and you know all these things and I just that's how I tackled that particular theme but I took that kernel of t- finding out about a relative based on my parents oh, my mom always said the Irish side of my family Uh, that we were related to lords and ladies in Ireland. And it used to crack everyone up, especially my dad. But my brother did an ancestry and he did, he hired a genealogist and found out, we traced uh, my mother's line back to the year 200. So we know lots about our relatives. And I thought, that's a cool idea for a book. You know, I went to a program at the White House. Um, Mm -hmm. It was at the time of Barack Obama's tenure and they had released the remake of roots and LeVar Burton, Valerie Jarrett, everybody was there. Mm -hmm. And we got a gift of a kit called 23 and me. And what had happened was that the director, uh, Walter, gosh, I can't remember his last name, 
but the director had done the kit of the genetics testing mm. and it turned out that he was related to lavar <gasps> so then he was saying wow. you know, why do we even have any of this racial tension because you might not know this but in through your bloodline you could be connected to somebody that you were hating the most it could be Absolutely. a black guy hating yeah yeah i've yeah. known people that find out the most amazing things through that and it does open your eyes and and it well it does for my character but it did for me in real life and and it kind of it it is a cool thing to see um where you come from and you know how you got there Exactly and I think we need to realize that there is a thread that we're all connected to. Yes. You know, there's a source that we're all connected to so there has to be somehow some way that we awaken to that connectivity and stop being so divided. You Speaking of really Lavar, I have his picture up because I was I launched Star Trek the Next Generation and his picture is up on the wall in my office. Beautiful. All right, there you go. There you go. <laughs> He's a my good guy. Boy. Small world. He follows me on Twitter. <laughs> But um, here's what we do. Um, you mentioned about the Aloha spirit. Do you remember mm -hmm. a few years ago? You and I were just really into the need to present a bill to Congress called the American Spirit Bill, where it would be like this law where you've just got to give respect to another person, and if you don't give respect, you should be arrested. <laughs> Exactly. Do you remember and it, that project that we worked on? Absolutely. And I remember um because we were talking about how in Hawaii they have the Aloha Spirit Law it was actually adopted into the state statutes. It's it's an amazing it's amazing because even if you don't agree, you should be respectful. You know, and all this the craziness that can happen that, that has been happening, you know, we really need to listen to different people and different viewpoints. But I think pointing to the fact that all of us have to live on this planet, you know, all of us have certain rights and we deserve to be treated with certain rights and respect. And we really have to treat others that like we would want to, because it, what goes around, I believe what goes around comes around. And when you create like the Hawaiians, they say, when you, live aloha and you live in the spirit it uplifts the mana the spirit of the planet and i think you and i totally that's got on board with that definitely resonated with that for those of you who are watching today and listening to this show i would really like you to keep in touch with us because i think with the current administration it would be a perfect time to reintroduce the American Spirit Bill. And I think we have a website or the change.org or something like that we had put together. We definitely But have a Facebook page. Yeah, we're going to have to revisit this. I yeah. think it's really important. We do have a Facebook page called America Spirit Bill. Mm -hmm. And you must look for either myself or Marianne. If you don't see mm -hmm. that, that's not the book. That's not the page. Right. So right. try to connect with that. Um, let's go back a little bit to the book. Mm -hmm. um, was there a particular chapter in the book that really sparked your excitement? You know, I loved writing about the 19th, the 18th century. I mean, the 19th century, the 1800s. It came so easy to me writing about that time period and the way people were and just being in visualizing England and Ireland and I love that about it um, and what the characters were going through because the, the two young people were victims of all the prejudice and everything that they had to live through. And then something else happens, this mystery, um, this, some, I don't want to give things away, but what, I actually wrote two or three of the scenes of the book just before I sent it to the publisher. I was going to send it off. And I had these dreams and I'm like, oops, got to put that in the book. <laughs> like almost like Marianne, you're forgetting something. <laughs> and it happened like a couple of nights in a row. And I'm like, okay, that, yeah, I can see where I need to put that in there, <laughs> you know, because it makes okay. sense. So it's like, it's so funny when you write a book, you kind of, 
at first, you know, you're kind of, oh, I have to sit down and write this thing and you have to make yourself do it. And then when you're doing it, you kind of get into it. And then you really, if you allow it, stuff comes to you in the strangest places and like out of the blue. And it's really cool because you can create that world. And I do like writing for that because you can, you can go anywhere. You know, Maybe, and was there any part in the book that, you know, as prophetic as it might have been, it reflected in your real life experience, too? Um, I'm trying to think of exactly, uh, you know, the relationship Kate has with her father, because I am, you know, my parents were my my dad is still alive. My mom died at 83, but um, I come from a close family and. I just, my parents just became more precious to me as I got older and um, they became friends, you know, uh, and I just, uh, Kate's father, they both had to deal with the loss of the mother and they're still dealing with it in this, in this book uh, to a certain point. And I had to do that in real life. And I actually used the experience when I was writing Lady in the Window, um, I changed the whole concept and then I was writing it because I placed it in Kauai because of the feelings I had when I I was there. But then I also learned my mother was sick and she died within, she was diagnosed and died within six weeks. So I put it in the book. I mean, I create, that came from my mom. It was like almost like a love letter to her. And, you know, Kate in uh, subsequent books, I, I, I had this, my fantasy is living all full time in Hawaii. (laughs) And I had this idea to have like, Oh, I love the fact that you have Ohana's over there where they can have friends and family come stay or visit and maybe multi-families on the property. So I thought I'm going to have her dad come live there when it's cold on the East coast. And so I think that that whole relationship And, um, and then, you know, there's so many little pieces that you don't even think about that you do interject. And it was funny because when I watch um, movies about um, Jane Eyre and, uh, you know, um, Jane Austen's life, there's a movie out there. She put little things from her life in there, just little tidbits that work. And that's what you do when you're a writer, if it works and it fits with the storyline, it kind of gets in there. Um, well, um, are you working on anything new now? I mean, is there anything in the making? Because I know a creative mind never goes to sleep. Yes. It's like, Uh, you're like, (laughs) yeah, I know it's crazy. Um, and I do like with cooking, I, you know, that's also creative and it's a fun outlet. You're away from the desk and you're standing up in the kitchen. So I am working on another cookbook. Um, and I'm also working on a a new novel, um, and and I'm playing around with the name, but that's also going to be taking place in present day and in another century and another in Europe. Um, and I have the mystery worked out, so I'm very excited to be working on that. Um, but I have other books that I want to write too. And so I always, I'm always, I I feel like I'm probably going to be doing a book a year at least it's going to be big. Oh, well, that's good. You know why? Yeah. Because I have a lot of stuff in there. I know. I know. <laughs> or, or stuff I really sparks me and I, I just want to do it. Marianne, use it. Live life <laughs> fully. Live it fully. Do not sit on a couch waiting yeah. for something to happen for you yeah. or to you. If yeah. you've got all that talent and stuff in here, use it. And I think all of you out there listening and watching this today, never ever wake up and say, you don't know what to do with your life. There's you no know what, what it is, really? You follow your passion. Yeah. For yeah, some people, yeah. it, it's teaching. You know, for some people, it it could be, you know, um, being a doctor, it being in the healthcare profession. Everyone has their thing. So it's whatever you like to do and nothing's right or wrong, really. It's like if you want to paint houses, go for it. You know, I mean, really, it really just is what you can create. And sometimes things change. And you don't always have a direct path like I didn't, you know, I, I knew that I wanted to do something, but I had to learn a lot of things first and, and kind of go through the ropes and 
and things happen, maybe you get sidetracked a little, but I think if you have your goal and it, being a writer, it's really, it's your, in your control because it's just you and the computer. It's just making time, a little time every day. If you do that, yeah. it's not so overwhelming. That's beautiful. It's beautiful. So in terms of as we get to the closing of our time together, is there anything in your heart that you're realizing since the pandemic that you are ready to change? I'm ready to change being so always on the go, you know, Mm -hmm. and it's been different. Mm -hmm. Am I comfortable with it yet? I don't know. I don't think so. A lot of my friends have said, Jen, as much as you think you want to go country, it ain't going to happen. So I think (laughs) I'm just going to, I'm just trying to find my balance. But what about you? Is there anything that you've kind of been noticing that you're open for change? I, I also, before the pandemic, was doing many things and because I have in my business and then in the writing and just a lot of meetings out of of the office and going, going, going. And I think the pandemic has forced you to kind of do things in a different way. And that actually, if, if you don't fight it, it actually works very well and it gives you a little more time. But I think I've allowed myself to enjoy things you know, when I, I'm really enjoying, like if I can sit down and watch a movie, if I read a book, I allow myself to do things that I might not have done before. But because that's also part of you get ideas that way, you know, and if I don't, if I feel like something's not going to happen, it's okay. Don't let it happen that day. It can happen tomorrow. But if anything, if anything, and I know this may sound totally corny, but appreciate little things, the flowers, coffee, tell people you love them, have people close to you. And we, through the Zoom, we have even done that more with friends and family I, in, in my world. And I think it's important to keep it up and having that loving connection. And if something's not working or doesn't feel good, try to see if you can deal with it. If not, put it aside because you really need to keep we need to keep our spirits up and our energy up and just really love. There's so much to love about life and we have to love it. Even if we can't always fly there or get there, there's so many things that you can love. That's that is right in front of you. And thank you so much. That was just perfect. Thanks for your shine, your glow, your spirit, your enthusiasm, your aloha spirit. (laughs) Thank Your you. Aloha spirit. And, you know, wishing you all the best on some more upcoming novels. I'm sure they're all going to help us to move our lives forward and just make us a lot more of a better version. Um, I think that was it. I think what you shared was just that right moment and note for us to end on because mm-hmm. we do need to recognize a lot in ourselves now. And what mm-hmm. better time to do it than now? Than now. Is, is there a best website that individuals can get a hold of you if they want to? Yes. Um, it's You can just go to alohawriter.com or marianrspencer.com is another one. I have a lot of different websites. The writer, I mean, you name it. I've got, I've got a million things, Simply Delicious Living. They all point to the same place. <laughs> But I think alohawriter.com or marianrspencer.com. Yeah. That's perfect. Thank you so much for joining us. Hey, okay. folks, I'm sure you took something from Marianne today. Um, I, I'm going to actually start with the method that she gave us the blueprint for even writing a little bit. I mean, think about it. You can fantasize and create any story you want in your head. Even if you don't go and get it published, just think about the joy of putting on paper a story about your own journey. I think that will be a great gift that you can hand over to the kids. Anyway, thank you so much for joining us on America Meditating Radio and The Next Normal. Remember, no one can take away your happiness unless you give them permission. And I suspect that when we wake up and mature, we'll realize that we're actually here to love each other the same. Take good care. All the very best. Stay safe.